nothing the government does can ever succeed, you know? <laughs> As, uh, I, th <laughs> I think uh, I think it was M Milton Friedman that, that said that uh, if the government was in charge of the Sahara Desert, they, they would run out of sand. This is The Mooncast. Space cowboy. I know you. You got your uh, plate full. You have a lot on. Dude, tell me about it. <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know. Um, sometimes I feel like, you know, I, I need to take like a long, like six month vacation or something. You know, it's just it's it's ridiculous. But you I know, hear you. It's fun, man. At the end of the day, you know, it's it's, it's producing stuff, making stuff, you know, um, it, it feels good to be wanted, you know, if, if that makes sense, you know? Um, yeah, so yeah, for sure. So I'm happy with it, man. So how, how are you, man? How are you? Can you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Let them know like a little bit about yourself, who you are, etc. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm Michael Pearl. Uh, I live in Israel, married, have three kids. Um, during the last uh, 10 years, even more than that, I was involved in uh, several fintech and crypto projects, mostly in uh, managerial positions. Um, I actually uh, came across crypto, I think in 2013. Back yeah. then it was a really niche esoteric field. And uh, I uh, came to learn about it. And uh, the more I dove in, basically I went down the rabbit hole. And yeah. at some point I wanted to, you know, to get my hands dirty. I wanted to actually uh, get involved with the industry. Um, so I worked with uh, several projects and um, the last project that I worked with was uh, Intentable. I was there for three, three years, which is a crypto project working on uh, Intent and um, uh, other uh, more DeFi oriented uh, fields. And recently I joined Cybers as the VP go to market. Uh, basically dealing with the entire uh, marketing and sales and partnerships uh, cycles, uh, where it's more of a Web3 cybersecurity direction, which is very interesting for me. Um, I'm, I guess we'll talk about it in a second, but I, I, I believe that, you know, it's one of the fields that uh, really are not well covered right now, and it's really hampering the industry from growing further. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you also, you, you serve too as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I served um I served for uh, 3 years, uh three mandatory service and one year uh beyond that uh as a as a as work basically. Uh and now I'm in the reserve, you know, uh, with the whole situation that we have in Israel. Unfortunately, you have to serve um always, so to speak. You have to be always committed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. How so when did you start taking crypto in the, in the web three industry serious like when was it like okay i'm gonna go full blown all, all hands on deck when did you decide that so uh, i i ran through uh, my my background but uh, just to be more granular just you know to build up the story so to speak uh i was covering the industry i was a journalist i was working uh, at first with uh, the biggest uh, business daily in israel covering global econo uh, the global economy basically and um, I was covering, you know, to some extent, the fintech industry, which was kind of a, at a very nascent stage. It was like 2013, I think. And uh, I came across crypto and I started, uh, you know, writing about it, covering it. And then I moved to a company called Finance Magnets, which is a uh, fintech oriented uh, news and uh, events and research company. And yeah. there I actually worked with the crypto companies. But then we went into this whole, you know, 2017 ICO craze, and I really had my hands dirty with the with the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point, when I joined Intentable, and even a little bit before that, when I was advising uh, different companies, uh, crypto companies on growth, uh, that's where I started getting involved and working in the industry. Um, and um, I'm super happy about it because the industry is is really engaging, super fascinating, super innovative. Everything is, you know, high speed and uh, you always have something new to learn. So that's why I really feel uh, comfortable with this industry and I'm, I'm so attached to it. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that bothers me a lot, you know, I think that, you know, there's people coming out with solutions like what you guys are doing at Cyverse, you know, trying to solve the cybersecurity landscape of crypto, because there's there's a lot of one avenue, too, as well, that, that, you know, it's kind of one of those sticky topics that a lot of people don't really like to talk about. They try to it's kind of taboo, so to speak, is, is about the scams. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you personally, uh, what do you think? about the, the current landscape when it comes to security and safety within the industry? What are the, what are the current bottlenecks that we're facing? Um, obviously, you, you, can, you can introduce and talk a little bit about cybersecurity too as well, but in the totality of all the different problems in terms of security that we're facing, what are they? Yeah, so I think that if we zoom out for a second and, and, and start kind of on, on a macro level, this industry, and again, I'm, I'm familiar with this industry specifically, maybe other industries, maybe the internet was the same when it first came out, right? It's but, still the <laughs> There's <yeah>. still scammers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm just saying that, you know, this industry started with a huge promise. And then there was the buildup upon a buildup upon a buildup, right? You know, uh, uh, like, look, like only like two years ago, we were talking about the metaverse. And Zuckerberg uh, changed the name of the of, of Facebook to Meta, mm -hmm. and people were talking about you know all of us living in the metaverse and and communicating in the metaverse. So there are a lot of big promises like DeFi, metaverse, um, deep in decentralized uh, personal identity. Um, um, you have the whole concept of uh, you know uh, decentralized uh, management of companies of countries and so on. Mm -hmm. The thing is the infrastructure is really years behind and it's lacking and it has a lot of you know it has more holes than swiss cheese basically so mm -hmm. that's the gaps that we need to fill so there are tons of different you know technological uh, challenges here which i'm not going to talk about which is not my forte but with respect to cybersecurity, just to position the conversation this is one of those holes one of those voids that need to be filled if this industry ever wants to get to the point that it wants to get to, right, to fulfill the promise. So zoom in on the cybersecurity issue. Look, uh, we just reported um, our uh, Q2 report for, from Cybers, and we actually found that $1.4 billion were stolen due to hacks. Wow. So $1.4 billion. Just and, from and just Q2. To give you yeah, just no, uh, from H1, sorry, from H1. Okay. Q2 was roughly, if I remember correctly, like uh, close to 700 uh, million. So it's wow. it kind of half half. Yeah. Um, and if you look at 2023, the entire year, it was around 1.7 billion. So I would give you an, an educated guess that this year will end with, with much higher numbers. So we're, we're going to pass probably the 2 billion uh, threshold, maybe even more than, than that. Who knows what's going to happen in H2? So that's just to give you a concept of the problems, right? Because at the end of the day, this industry is not that huge in terms of, you know, the TVL. It fluctuates, right? I mean, now we're kind of getting, um, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, in an upward uh, direction because there is a hype and, and, and you know, the, the, there's kind of a bullish direction right now. But, but it's still a quite a small industry and losing so much money due to hacks. And I'm not even talking about, you know, mistakes and scams and many, many other things that are uh, also causing at the end of the day, the end user to lose its money. It's something that is, is really unbearable. And we're not going to get to you know your aunt and, and my, I don't know, uh, um, friend who is skeptical to, to get into the industry if that's going to be the situation. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, it's not only the quality, quantity, it's also the quality because the hackers are becoming more sophisticated and the scammers are becoming more sophisticated. There are, you know, conglomerates involved. There are countries involved. You know, we're one of the biggest experts. Our uh, co-founder and CEO is one of the biggest experts on the Lazarus Group, which is uh, affiliated with North Korea. And wow. you see it's a, it's a big boys game, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's no longer just a dude sitting in the garage of his parents. It's something on a much bigger scale. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're um, uh, eliminating all those bad actors and, and their uh, practices if you want this industry to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you look at the, 
new because the, the speed in which the technology and the technological advancements are happening do you think that is a correlation to the increase in cyber attacks for sure for sure um look we, we see a very clear correlation between the amount of money flooding uh, pouring into the industry and the money that is get, getting stolen from the industry but also the more uh, you know, technological advantages you have, the, the more, um, um, you know, new tools that you have. At the end of the day, you only see the, the, the nice picture, right? So, for instance, if there's a new Tesla car, right? I'm not talking about Tesla, let's take a different brand, right? But if you have a new electrical car, you only see that it's going to be, I don't know, driving faster and you'll have more battery to, to drive and more, you know, bandwidth and so on. You're not going to see all the bad stuff, right? That that it brings w w along with it, like I don't know, pollution or or um, uh, radiation or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm just giving you an example. So the, the the same thing is with crypto. Take the DeFi industry. You know, we just had the DeFi summer about two years ago, and people were only looking at the APY, at the yield, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what they were focused on. But they never realized, and some of them realized, but very late on, that when they put their money there in a smart contract, this smart contract can be breached, and then thousands of people can lose their money at a heartbeat. Same thing for the, for the projects uh, themselves, right, for the founders. They were oriented on building technology and marketing and so on, but they didn't really think about the security. So I get it, right? You don't want to think about it. You don't want to spend money on it. But it's there. You, you can just ignore it. Yeah. Well, what do you think about the because I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the countries that are holding Bitcoin, for instance. Right. How do you think do you think that they're taking the right security measures to be able to have the capacity to make sure that these scams don't don't happen or they're not they don't get hacked or because I'm looking at, you know, um, I, I just saw recently Germany was dumping some some Bitcoin and it's kind of funny because I think they were doing it on a centralized exchange. So I thought like, don't they have a little bit better security? Can they do it OTC? Like, isn't there other different avenues that they could take? How do you see the security from the governmental perspective, the nation state perspective um, with when it comes to this industry? So as a libertarian-ish person, I would say that nothing the government does can ever succeed, you know? <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think it was Milton Friedman that, that said that uh, if the government was in charge of the Sahara Desert, they, they would run out of sand, right? <laughs> <laughs> I agree, so, bro. I agree. So I'm not, I'm not very hopeful about that. But but seriously, though, um, countries don't really have the infrastructure. I see that in Israel, and I know that is the same in the States. They don't have the infrastructure, the proprietary infrastructure to, to do that, mm -hmm. only because they are kind of playing a double game where they, on one hand, want to portray crypto as kind of a gray or even like a red zone, you know, uh, industry, right? Mm -hmm. Scams and, and uh, terror funding and all that, which mm -hmm. we all know that it's not really true because uh, the, the, the biggest sponsor of all the malicious activity is still fiat money. Exactly. And uh, it's even easier to do that there. But given the fact that that's the picture that they portray, they do not want to be fully engaged with it in a sense of building, let's say, a like a state custodian, which yeah. is something interesting, right? I mean, I actually I never thought about it until you raised the question. But how come countries don't have their own custodians? You know, just at, at least to keep the treasury that they're you know forfeiting from uh, bad actors or things of that sort. So I would guess that they don't have uh, proper measures. They're working with, uh, um, you know, third party, you know, providers, um, it, which which is kind of funny. Let, let's say take the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they're working with the uh, Coinbase custody at the I, same time at the same time that the SEC is persecuting uh, Coinbase? Yeah, I, I, I do believe they are. But this is this how this is how weird the world works. Right. A lot of it doesn't make sense. Like if you look at, for instance, I just I just break down something that's really funny to me. Like the U.S. issues out treasury bonds. China buys most of those treasury bonds, right? So it, it doesn't make sense because China is funding then the war indirectly with Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the U.S. takes taxpayers dollars to pay back China, 
who then uses that money then to prop up their economy and their military. So this is how the, the, the world is now currently. Like everyone's kind of like all intertwined and uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, kind of how when you look at all the synergies of, you know, fiat. And also, I, I don't think that a lot of uh, governments currently right now today in present day modern day capitalism have the, the capacity, the financial capacity to to maybe uh, invest as they would like to on, on crypto infrastructure. But I don't know what you think about that. Maybe they have other issues that they need to work on. You know, U.S. used to continue funding their military industrial complex, but they have the exorbitant privilege of exporting inflation to everybody else. So mm -hmm. um, that's how they're able to do it. But if you look at smaller countries, um, it's kind of difficult. You know, El Salvador was able to do it, though, but they prioritize yeah. that a lot, you know. Um, and even then, their security, it's it's... Because it's not uh, government ran or government owned, they they leased it out to a private um, sector, right? To the private sector, as they should, because the government yeah. is inefficient. Um, so when you look at the landscape of of how you know the current situations are, when it comes to the, to the fiat currency and the, and the fiat landscape, do you see them investing more into into security moving forward? Like, how do you see that particular landscape of you know cybersecurity sector within the crypto niche? I think that at the end of the day, the more uh, crypto con countries will hold, and the more uh, the bigger segment of the economy of the of the respective country will rely on, on crypto, yeah. they will have to to engage in some sort of a, uh, some sort of security measures and mm -hmm. maybe even impose regulation on the the private sector. Because think about it, uh, take the STC for instance; mm -hmm. they are so sensitive about investors, you know, especially retail investors losing money to, you know, unlicensed uh, financial schemes and so on, the way they call it. But they're not even thinking about the fact that you can lose much more as an investor if the, the, the platform that you're working on, that you're investing in, you know, maybe it's even regulated. If it's hacked, you can lose much more money, right? Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, um, again, being... Uh, libertarian-ish, I wouldn't call for regulation for everything. I'm, I'm just calling for, for some awareness, right? I don't want mm -hmm. the government imposing regulations on how on, on, on which security measures um, uh, crypto projects have to take. But I think that this awareness n must come from the grassroots and people have to be grown-ups about it mm -hmm. and understand that th those are one of the, of the dangers that crypto companies have the same way that, you know, somebody can just diss them on X and then they can lose their whole reputation. Same thing can happen with the hack. And I think that even if you calculate the risk here, the risk arising from scams and hacks is much, much bigger than other issues that they are dealing with. Yeah. So when you look at the main attacks currently in the industry. Can By the way, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Just one more thing about uh, the, the government issue. Mm -hmm. I think that um, one very interesting thing uh, to look at and actually wanted to write about it is the fact that I think that the current U.S. elections mm -hmm. are the most crypto um, hyped U.S. elections or any elections ever. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just uh, in Austin for, for consensus mm -hmm. and you walk in the streets and you see the truck of RFK of, uh, of uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was there, he was speaking at the conference, and his team is there. And they're uh, targeting this quite small community of crypto people, right? Mm -hmm. But they are so much focused on it. And you see how, you know, Trump is trying to, sh to present himself as the crypto champion. And yeah. I I I'm not really sure about his plans for it. And it has a very close connection to what you talked about with the dollar and uh, the export of inflation. And so on. I I'm not really sure how they're going to play it. But yeah. even if it's just talk, right? I, I'm not sure what happens with the with the Democrats with that respect. I was just not. I, I just didn't have the chance to to explore that. But you see that crypto is a major issue here, yeah. and I think that the crypto companies and Coinbase primarily are also using the fact that it's an election season and they're mm -hmm. trying to put it at the center of the of, of the debate. Do you think that I don't know if you're aware that Trump got shot? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you think? Yeah. Do you think that's it's a it's a win for crypto and the storyline of crypto that he you know he thankfully didn't get you know unalived, um, and he's still present. Do you think that's even 
fuels the, the crypto narrative even more now that he's still standing and um, fuels his narrative even more because he was against crypto actually a few years ago. You know, if you've yeah. been following, you know, his um, mindset and mind state of crypto. So do you think it's a it's a net positive thing in the end? Um, or how do you how do you view that, that the whole that whole situation? I think that, again, I have nothing smart to say. And again, fortunately, uh, he's uh, he, he didn't uh, suffer a, a much more serious injury and so on. So that's yeah. I think, you know, just as a, just for your democracy, I hope that, uh, you know, such thing uh, is not going to happen. Uh, with respect to to crypto, I think that think about it. He's like the whole narrative, like the whole, the, whole, the entire thing that the pundits say about Trump right now in general, right? Mm -hmm. That he's much more disciplined, let's say about abortion and stuff like that. That you know he's kind of moved to the center, at least uh, at least in terms of his rhetoric. So yeah. the mere fact that he was anti-crypto and now he's pro-crypto, that doesn't tell you much about Trump. It tells you much about the narrative and 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 the 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 societal approach of the the u.s citizens to crypto and this is what what's amazing you know i like putting trump aside or rfk i think that the mere fact that they are putting this at the center of their elections and not you know the situation in the middle east the inflation yeah. the, the the gas prices and so on i think that this is really interesting like that's something that uh I think it's like a pivotal moment in history with respect to crypto and the approach to crypto. Do, do you think crypto needs the government or the government needs crypto? I think that um, at the end of the day, you know, putting some um, utopian libertarian uh, dreams aside, the, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being, being realistic. The government is the government. It's not going to yeah. go away in any country. Uh, if something, I think it's only be, going to become stronger. So I think that the, the crypto needs the government. Uh, the government doesn't need crypto, but I think that the government cannot kill crypto. Even in China, which is an authoritarian country, you see so, so many Chinese players, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, projects and corporations that um, have relocated to Hong Kong. And then when Hong Kong became heated, they moved to Singapore and Dubai. Um, and, and essentially, at the end of the day, they have their servers, servers in China. They have developers in China. Uh, Chinese money is flowing into those exchanges and you know custodians and, and back. So if, if the Chinese government could not kill crypto, uh, I don't think that um, a democratic uh, government can kill crypto. So I think that they need to learn how to coexist. Mm -hmm. They need to learn how to... Um, basically smoke out the bad players. And that's what we basically started from, uh, started the conversation from. Mm. Uh, definitely, you know, I don't think that it should be the Wild West with, with respect to uh, money laundering and terror funding. We mm. all understand the severity of this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but everything kind of on the fringes of it, you know, they can let go of the industry and let the people do what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I find it super fascinating to see how you know the government and crypto can work together but i ultimately do believe that we, it doesn't the, the crypto industry doesn't really need the government's approval to continue doing what it what it does um because of how it's designed um i want to shift over to ask you just a little bit if you could just for the audience sum up what how you would describe what cybersecurity is and i know it's very generic because it means a lot of different stuff but what does it mean to you and how does it apply thoroughly in, you know, in your explanation to um, the crypto industry and uh, the blockchain uh, sector? Hey bro, I'm just trolling. It's something that will not just challenge your perspective, but also touch your heart and soul. It's a book that defies convention, blending art and literature into a thought-provoking masterpiece, a reflective piece of provocative art that tackles societal constructs from angles you've never considered. Hey bro, I'm just trolling delves into the very essence of our existence. It questions the technology that surrounds us, challenges our notions of beauty, stares unflinchingly into the eyes of death, and questions the boundaries of freedom. It scrutinized the educational system that molds our very future. This book is a journey, an exploration of shared human experience, and it's a work of art that refuses to be confined by tradition. It's a canvas painted with words, a melody of thought, and a testament to the power 
of creativity in a world dominated by algorithms and data. Visit MoonboyCapitalVentures.com and get your hands on Hey Bro, I'm Just Trolling today. It's not just a book. It's a movement. Now let's jump back into the show. I think that, again, I think that all your listeners know what cybersecurity is, and, and I'm, I'm sure that they hear in the news here and there about, uh, you know, smaller hacks kind of in the more, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of in the commercial side of things, right, that somebody mm-hmm. hacked uh, a website and, and changed the website and phishing attacks and so on. Um, and they even hear about, about it uh, on the more kind of governmental and, um, you know, even military level. How cybersecurity, how cyber attacks, well, are being militarized, right? Yes. But I think that with respect to crypto, what's so interesting about it is the fact that you can access huge amounts of money, and you can uh, uh, just take them at a heartbeat. Okay, yes. huge amounts of money, and the I'm not going to go into everything, but given the structure of, let's say, if we're talking about um, the decentralized finance, right? Given the fact that uh, you have smart contracts that are holding huge amounts of money without any segregation between the accounts. And essentially everything is in one pool that can be just drained. Uh, At the end of the day, this is something that is really unique. And then uh, even more interesting is the fact of uh, how you launder the money. It's not that easy. It's much more complicated than than you might think, you know, um, uh, and contrary to, to what crypto usually uh, to the perception of crypto, right? Mm-hmm. But still, it's a it's a huge scheme. It's a huge method. We now hear all the time in the news about Tornado Cash. Uh, only recently, during the last uh, weekend, we heard about uh, the Tor- Tornado Cash founder. Uh, so it's, it's a very unique method of stealing money, which is, I wouldn't say it's easy, because we actually examine in cybers the ROI of, of, of the hackers. Uh, they have to invest a lot of money into, uh, you know, uh, manpower. It's 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 like a startup of its own, right? So you have to invest money in, into into manpower, into uh, infrastructure, gas fees. Uh, then you have to wait. Time is also money, right? So yeah. not always you can execute what you want. You have to wait sometimes for six months before you have this, uh, you know, uh, this opportune moment when you can execute your hack. So it, it's really interesting, and I think it's really unique. Uh, as opposed to the more traditional cyber threats of the world. Yeah, it, it's when you can you a little bit break down in more detail why they need to invest an entire team and what those like uh, parties or members of those teams are actually doing. How are they able to facilitate the hacks? So just to give you an example, uh, we very recently uncovered uh, the biggest address poisoning scam in history. Address mm-hmm. poisoning, for those who don't know, very simply put, is me tricking you to mm-hmm. send me your money, thinking you're sending, sending this to your friend, to, uh, I don't know, a service provider, to your employee, and so on. Mm-hmm. So the way I do it is I poison your, your wallet yeah. with um, uh, a log, a transaction log, which has a, an address that is very similar to an address that you're usually sending money to, Okay. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, when I want to send money to that address that I know of and I send money to every day, let's say you work, but you have an employee Mm -hmm. and you're sending him or her like 5K every month. Okay. And and then I I trick you to send these 5K to me. Mm -hmm. So I have to, to, uh, first of all, research because I have to figure out that your wallet is big enough, you know, it holds enough money, that you're sending big enough transactions that they are frequent enough for for you to actually send it to me and for me to trick you with that. And then I have to wait. I have to poison your wallet. Uh, Sometimes I also have to send you, by poisoning, I mean sending you either fake tokens or a small uh, small amount of real tokens. And then then I have to wait. And in order for for me to succeed in that, it's kind of like a, a sales funnel, right? You have a conversion, which is which is which goes down the the more you progress uh, along the funnel. So yeah. they have to do it on mass. They have to do it to thousands of different uh, wallet addresses. So have to, they have to research. They have to create fake wallets. Sometimes they have to mint fake tokens. They have to do all the transfers, and then they have to wait. So it's it's think about it. It's a it's a huge operation, a very sophisticated one. 
for which you need hardware, software, developers, uh, operators, um, maybe some sort of a, a automatic tracking mechanism. I think maybe AI is involved right now. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like a, an entire operation, which is malicious, but it's quite genius then, then again, yeah. right? If you yeah, think yeah. about it. Yeah, abs absolutely. So I just want to make sure I, I got that correct. So when I am in my, let's say, MetaMask wallet, yeah. and I am doing frequent transactions to, let's say, an employee, right? And I'm sending them funds, you know, to so that they can you know, um, feed their family and so on. So when the public address shows up, it looks very similar to the normal public address that I would usually send, but they may be changing a couple of those uh, public address uh, symbols, right? T to trick you yeah. into thinking. And so maybe the, the beginning and the end is the same, but in the middle, it's slightly nuanced. It's slightly different. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, th there's this um, like um, l like a meme that, that is circulating, you know, being mm -hmm. sent on WhatsApp and so on of, uh, you know, you can write like a whole sentence with uh, using the same the, 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 the same letters in the beginning. Let's say I'm, if I'm writing Moon Boy. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can yeah. omit one one letter or I can maybe, I don't know, add like uh, change the moon, the O in the moon to P or something like that. Yeah. But if it's a word that I'm that I know of, I'm not reading the entire word. That's the way our brain works. Mm. You're reading the beginning and the end, and you see yeah. more or less the size and the typology of the of the of the word, yeah. and you're filling the blanks in your brain. You're not wasting the time. That's what skimming through means, right? Because you're yeah. just reading this without reading every single letter. Yeah. So the same thing when you look at an address which is familiar to you, right? If you're sending mm. uh, uh, funds to this address all the time. So at one point, you will not notice if that's a very, very similar address and you will copy it and you will paste it in your MetaMask and you will send uh, your money to that wallet. Um, and then until that person notifies you that he didn't get the money, you will not even know that. Yeah. Okay. That That's interesting because how, how, do, they, how do they generate the public address to make it similar to match your address. That's why I'm a little bit confused about how do they, how do they do that? So how are they making it similar to your address from the beginning and the ending portions of your actual public address that you're sending to somebody else? So there's a way of doing that. I'm not the tech person to explain that, but yeah. you need to have proper hardware okay. and you need to, and you need to spend a lot of uh, uh, gas fees on, on uh, funding that. So they're not uh, manufacturing it one by one. They're manufacturing thousands of, of those addresses on mass, right? And then they pick from the ones that they uh, manufacture, they, they pick some that are kind of similar, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to produce a lot of those in order for you to find one or two that are similar to the address of the victim, right? So yeah. it's something that is um, uh, very, very, very demanding. And again, it costs a lot of money. So that just goes to show that, that it's a big boys game. It's not just something mm -hmm. that you can do. Uh, again, some, some hacks, and we do see that. Uh, only recently I, wrote, I read about uh, two brothers being arrested in Canada uh, mm -hmm. for stealing, I think, $25 million. But even them, you know, what they really worked in their garage. Even for them, it was a few months of work. Um, so it, it wasn't cheap even for the, for the little guy, right? Yeah. Um, I guess my next question would be, how are they getting or capable of getting access to the wallet? So they're not getting access to the wallet. So how are they you manipulating are... it? How, how are they able to, how are they able to manipulate the, 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 re the receiving address? Like, how are they able to do that? It, obviously you need the seed phrase, right? To mm -hmm. get access to a wallet. So that's why I'm, I'm curious, like, how is that manipulation being able to happen, um, in real time? So specifically with respect to, uh, to address poisoning, we're not talking about a hack. It's a full-blown scam. Okay, I'm not okay. hacking anything. I just have a wallet that looks yes. very much like a wallet that you know of. And I'm tricking you to send freely. You're doing that. I'm not doing anything. I'm just tricking you to do that. Mm -hmm. The way I'm tricking you to do that is I'm spamming your log. And then when you go to Etherscan, which is something, or BSC scan or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Which is something that all of us are doing to, I don't remember, let's say if I'm sending money to you frequently, I don't remember your address. And 99% of us are not organized with 
lists and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do usually, I'm going to go to my Ether scan. I'm going to see, oh, right, I sent this this one and this one on April 4th. Okay, I'm going to copy paste it and I'm, I'm going to send it again, right? Yeah. So that's something that if you were if you were a little bit more meticulous, you could have just saved yourself a whole lot of money. But again, it's a, it's a matter of awareness. Now we at Cybers, uh, we're helping plenty of companies and projects to protect them because if you're a just a regular retail user, you can solve this by being careful. But if you're working, if you have a whole you know um, a billing system uh, within your company and you're working on mass with many different addresses and so on, then you need to automate this because also it's not a one one man show because you have several employees doing that and so on. So you need to have some sort of a system that will help you to mitigate that and to prevent that. And that's what actually what we do right now. We're helping companies and we can alert them, let's say if their wallet was poisoned, even before they thought of sending this transaction, we can stop it there, right? Because we can tell them, listen, somebody's poisoning your wallet. We noticed that. Make sure that, you know, uh, this is the address. Next time you're, you're sending something to this address, make sure you're not copy pasting it you're i don't know storing it somewhere else there are different me methods to go about it so that's that's in a nutshell what we do with what that about, respect what about tracking the because just to get clarity on this so when you if someone sends or creates or generates a fake token and puts it inside somebody's wallet that's random if someone were to interact with that said token, would it trigger something within the wallet so they were, they'd be able to get some kind of access to the wallet that they weren't no. able to get before? No, it's it, it's not like a, let's say, Trojan, Trojan horse, right? And uh, and that's something that actually I just men mentioned Lazarus. Uh, one of the ways that they work, by the way, with crypto companies, the, the, the interesting thing about it is that they are hacking crypto companies mm -hmm. from the Web 2 side and not from the Web 3 side. Yeah. So they're, let's say, uh, choosing uh, a developer inside the company, sending them a very lucrative um, uh, offer, uh, you know, uh, presumably being, let's say, Coinbase or, or I don't know, Fireblock, some other big corporation that is very interesting and, and you know, that you would like to work at. And they're sending you, at the end of the day, they're sending you a PDF, you're opening the PDF, boom, they're in the system, and that's it. And they're doing it from the Web2 side, and then once they have control of the servers of the company, they can actually go and commit what they want on chain, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the same thing with address poisoning. Address poisoning, again, there is no hack involved. It's it's a matter of, of behavioral psychology, period. Mm -hmm. They're just doing that in a sense that it, it sounds like very, um, uh, very simple, right? And, and maybe even not so sophisticated, like you're spamming my log and that's going to trick me to send money. But actually, it works, right? And people are not even aware of that. So it works uh, too, too often, unfortunately. Okay, so just to, just to make sure I got this right. You, if somebody sends, because here's the thing. When I see my MetaMask, it sometimes alerts me and says like, okay, there's a fake wallet. Or a, not a fake wallet, but a fake, fake token, token within my wallet, right? Yeah. That If I interact with that fake token within the wallet, it doesn't do anything to my wallet at all, right? Because they still need the seed phrase to be able to do anything to my funds within the wallet, right? Again, as far as I know, and, and I might be wrong here, but yeah. the fake token is, is not, is not the, the, um, the gateway to your wallet. It's just a method to trick you. By the way, there are other reasons that are slightly less malicious to send you fake tokens because yes. it's a side talk, but let's say um, token holders, they want to have as many token hold, uh, token token issuers, sorry, want to have as many token holders as possible, right? They yeah. want to show the big numbers. So uh, it works for them to send you five bucks worth of uh, XYZ token uh, just for you to hold it in your wallet and maybe they don't mean anything wrong, right? Yeah. They just want to kind of, but again, you have to be cautious about fake tokens, fake NFTs, because they're, you know, best, best to stay away and best to, to, uh, to be alert when, when such tokens arrive in your wallet. Are you, are you guys using, are you using Arkham to track people or hackers in the information and so on? Or how are you, how are you, what are you using? So the way that we actually do what we do, and maybe 
I, I, I should have uh, kind of just to give you the big picture of, of what we do, right? So we have uh, we're scanning several blockchains, block mm -hmm. by block, 24/7, and what we do is we, we're searching for anomalies in real time. Yeah, and we have created five different AI models that were trained on thousands and thousands of different uh, malicious activities, hacking incidents, scams, uh, address poisoning, phishing attacks, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And we studied each and every one of those incidents, and we have found different typologies in them, different patterns, right? And whenever we see some sort of an anomaly, we pick it up, we examine this via those uh, uh, AI engines, and then immediately we can tell you, obviously I'm simplifying it. My CTO is going to kill me. But just, just uh, to, to understand, we're uh, examining that. And then at a split of a second, we can tell you if it's a hack, if it's a preparation for a hack even, right? Because we, mm -hmm. we oftentimes catch it at the preparation stage. If you remember uh, Minority Report, the movie, mm -hmm. so it's kind of, uh, kind of like that. You know, when the hacker is only considering and thinking and only preparing, we, we can catch him at that phase. Uh, so, and then we, we can actually alert the clients and then the clients do what they do, right? Because if you're working with the crypto, with the DeFi project, they, they may have some, some on-chain mechanisms to mm -hmm. stop the hack, to funnel the money to a different address and so on. Uh, CFI is right, slightly different because it's uh, more centralized. So they have their own mitigation processes, but we're the ones that are, you know, uh, giving them the trigger to initiate that process. Yeah. Okay. Um, so are you guys only mainly working with uh, businesses? And if so, what is it is it like a specific amount that it's like a threshold of, okay, we need to be helping secure a minimum of 100,000, you know, USDT, or we just it's not worth our time. And also as well with the organizations that you know, you said are basically facilitating entire teams to be able to to facilitate the hacks. I, I guess there's a minimum threshold that you're that you guys are looking for that see you see a triggering point like is it is it 10 million is it 5 million like how are you guys basically navigating the the, the value sets and also um seeing if something's worth your time to work with this company or something's not worth your time to work with this company how does that work so in terms of what we're scanning we're scanning everything even a theft of one dollar we want to know about it because sometimes it's an indicator of something of, of you know, uh, a, a much bigger, maybe it's a, like a test or something of that sort. So that's from our side. On the mm -hmm. commercial level, we're working only with companies, but having said that, uh, plenty of, of companies and projects, let's say wallets, exchanges, they are using our technology uh, and implementing this and integrating it into their system. They're allowing, they're protecting their users and they're allowing their users to use our system without maybe even knowing that Cybers is on the other side, right? Because yeah. we're doing it uh, kind of as a white label and, you know, giving them uh, the, they can be at the front and we're doing the work uh, on the back end. Yeah. Uh, by the way, another thing that we're doing, which is um, not protecting the assets per se, but it's more uh, of a threat mitigation tool. So given the fact that we can scan all the blockchains and we can see all the malicious activity. So let's say if you have a hack, we can map all the players in this hack, right? So we can obviously map the victim and we can see what's the malicious smart contract that was deployed. We can see which wallet deployed this malicious smart contract. Maybe there is another wallet that funded the, the, the smart contract. So it's, mm. so it's a whole kind of an ensemble of different addresses that are involved in. And we can also see which wallets are um, adjusting to them and so on. So we're adding 1 million listen to the number, 1 million malicious addresses per week. I'm talking about malicious wallets, malicious smart contracts, and so on. And given the fact that we have a huge database, which is real time, right? So if a wallet was involved in a hack, you're going to know about it a second later if you screen it. We can, create, we can allow you to screen any address and to assess the risk that may arise from interacting with it. So that's what we do with many, many companies and with that respect, a lot of retail users, a lot of end users are using us. Again, sometimes without knowing that they're using us because they're uh, working with a wallet that we're working with or with an exchange and so on. Uh, so they're giving their end users 
the ability to screen that. Sometimes they have to opt in. Other times it's just it just works on the background. And then once they want, let's say, to send money to a wallet that is involved in a hack, scam, um, uh, sanctioned wallet, and so on, they're going to have a pop-up window saying, you know, beware. Do you really want to do that? And, and that's the, the protection that, that we're providing. It's more of a threat mitigation rather than, you know, cybersecurity protection, but it all derives from the same mechanism that we have, which is quite unique and, and, and extraordinary, extraordinary, if I may say. Yeah. Are you guys using any sort of artificial intelligence uh, stuff to, you know, in the back end to be able to speed up or automate the process? Yeah, yeah. So just to give you some background, uh, both of the founders, they are uh, specialists in uh, artificial intelligence and they, they implemented their knowledge. They actually have 11 patents in AI and they actually implemented that, that knowledge in the more kind of a traditional industries, you know, spotting um, uh, anomalies in, in manufacturing and things of that sort. And they took the knowledge that they had there. They implemented this on the blockchain obviously with adjustments. So uh, that's that's basically the secret sauce, right? The AI models. And uh, they were thinking about AI before it was cool. So kudos to them. Uh, but but yeah, you know, AI is is, is the whole engine that, that is running things. And how long has the, the company been around for? Uh, so the company was founded two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, let's say, a very, very fast acceleration of the company. Now we have uh, quite a few dozens of, uh, of clients, uh, big clients in the industry. Um, we're actually going to um, put out some announcements this week and the following week. Uh, so we, you know, things are really, it's really picking up pace. You know, we're working with a lot of uh, companies of all sorts, uh, DeFi projects, uh, entire blockchains. Uh, we're the security provider of Consensus with their Linea L2 uh, blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, working with some institutionals, we recently signed with uh, 21 shares. Um, and again, bridges, centralized exchanges, any type of crypto company that you can think of. Do, do you see more? Do you see it more being able to be susceptible to hacks in layer two or layer one uh, sort of protocols? And like, because I think the security should be way less on the layer two side versus the layer one side when um you look at you know the the lineas or you look at you know the mm -hmm. optimisms the arbitrums you know the polygons and um how do you how do you see the difference between the layer one and layer two when you guys are looking at and analyzing different sorts of um security breaches and so on i think that at the end of the day everything evm uh mm -hmm. is more or less the same you know everything that is evm uh compatible, so to speak, is more or less the same. Because at the end of the day, you have smart contracts and you, and, and, and that's all you, you have to know, right? Yeah. The, the fact that the transaction is being settled on an L1 and not on the L2, obviously it has some uh, implications on, on the way that we provide the protection. But at the end of the day, when you have smart contracts, they're susceptible to being breached and hacked. And one of the biggest lies and misconceptions in the... EVM space is the fact that companies think that if they were audited, then that's it. You know, they're safe and secure. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like you think that, you know, you have the biggest uh, lock on your door and that's it. Nobody can hack you. But nobody thinks about the fact that you have a window that you haven't secured. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm all for that. We're working with auditing companies and audits are very important, but you need to have this 24 seven monitoring. Now, with respect to your question, obviously there are some nuances and differences between different chains and, and different um, uh, levels, you know, L1s and so on. Yeah. And obviously now, by the way, we're also adding Bitcoin, which is a whole different story, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a different technology, it's, yes. it's different um, uh, dangers and, and different ways to go about them. But um, at the end of the day, you know, blockchains are blockchains and, and people can find ways to hack them. Some are more secured, uh, but uh, the EVM blockchains, let's remember that um, we all love them because they're so simple and you have the standardization of tokens and other things, right? But it also makes them more vulnerable and uh, that's why it's even more important to secure them. If 
people want to reach Cyverse, where, where could they find Cyverse on the internet so they could they could reach Cyverse and uh, try to get some of those services? So uh, it's a very good question because uh, one of the things that we do, and again, we do, we're doing it for the, the industry and for the community, um, besides from the Cyverse um, um, uh, handle on Twitter, which obviously I encourage you all to, fo to, to, to follow, we have the Cyverse Alerts, which is a handle that basically posts only alerts on ongoing uh, hacks and scams. And it's it's quite popular, you know. We're getting a lot of feedback there. You will see a lot of comments there, and uh, we're constantly cited by the media and by uh, different uh, you know thought leaders in the industry. And I really urge you guys to follow that because if if nothing, if for nothing, just to get some general education on the amount of hacks and the types of hacks. And we're tr trying to publish. We're obviously publishing only the big ones because as we speak, we're 49 minutes into the talk. I can bet you that we have about, I don't know, 200 incidents that already happened while we spoke right now. So we're, we're publishing the bigger ones, the bigger names, the bigger amounts. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I really urge you guys to follow Cybers and Cybers Alerts uh, to get all the information. Uh, obviously, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also reach out to myself and, and to the other uh, leaders in the, in the company. Uh, and you go, can go to our website, cybers.ai. Uh, and just uh, read about what we do. And you, again, if somebody has any questions or wants to uh, learn more, uh, you're more, more than welcome to reach out to me. Yeah, definitely. Michael, man, thank you so much for this. Uh, this has been super informative. And uh, any last words before we go? Um, I would just love to say that, you know, just like, you know, insurance and um, uh, car accidents and so on, nobody wants to think about security, right? But we have to be grown up about it and think about security and think about uh, other, um, um, you know, threat vectors that we have, like scams and hacks and, and frauds. And it's, it, it's only going to grow and become more sophisticated. So you don't have to be scared, right? You have to go. I really encourage all of you to do your thing in crypto and to, to uh, uh, not not become you know uh, cocooned and, and not do anything, but be uh, attentive to the dangers. See if you can mitigate the dangers either yourself or through the companies that you're working with. Make sure that the companies have some sort of a security standard that they're working with the right security providers. Uh, don't only check the APY. Check also if they are protected, if they have been audited and monitored, and um, We'll let us do the rest, basically. Yeah. Michael, man, I, I appreciate your time, man. We got to do this again, get an update on Cyverse in the near future, man. I, I appreciate you so much. Uh, this concludes this Thank episode you so much. of the Mooncast, man. Uh, have a good one and peace. Take care.